Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, whatever your local time may be. Uh, my name is Gu Peng. I'm one of the co-chairs of ESIP Information Quality Cluster. On behalf of the um, working, uh, the workshop organizing committee, and I welcome you to this virtual pre-ESIP workshop, which is co-organized by IQC and sponsored by ESIP. I'm very happy to see you all. We have about 29 people joined for this first live session, um, which I will be leading along with Carlo, Bob, and Yashin. And if you have not done so, please enter your information in the Kiko chat notes or in the Zoom chat. Very well, we're doing great. And uh, the notes also contain some other uh, relevant information. And I have um, some of the resources here. And if you need to browse during the session or between the session. A few things before I hand the mic over to Carlo for the um, why we're here and what we are trying to achieve for this workshop. And first of all, the session is recorded. Uh, second, to minimize the interference and all participate will be muted. And you're encouraged to enter your questions in notes, uh, which is a shared Google Doc and in chat, Zoom chat. And we also encourage you to uh, change the uh, Zoom account name. And to do so, uh, if you have over your name and you either have three dots next to your name or a more, you click on that, that will get you to rename so that will help the other participants to recognize you. And uh, at the same time, place you have, um, um, if you have over that, you also see, um, let's see what, what happened to, yeah. So you, you see some of the additional options for you, including uh, you can raise your hand to speak and during the uh, Q&A session, you can unmute yourself to speak or you can click the raise hand part to um, have the organizers to unmute you to speak. Uh, we have a very packed agenda and uh, we have the um, first uh, set some context and the goal of the workshop, then followed by six presentations and then followed by uh, presentation Q&A. We'll have a break about 15 minutes to review case statement. Uh, if you have not get a chance to uh, look at it ahead of time and the the word a key statement in words is attached at the end of the notes and after that we'll have uh, live following questions and hopefully um, the pass forward and uh, hopefully we will um, have a consensus on some um, timelines in terms of the development of the guidelines. So without further ado, and I'm hand over the mic to Carlo. Carlo, would you be able to unmute yourself? And who's also the co-lead of this effort? Hello everybody. Thank you, Jipeng, for welcoming in. 
the participants to this uh, first PRESIP uh, workshop. So I would like to start with uh, giving context uh, about what we want to achieve. So it will uh, lead to the different goals that we would like to address during this workshop and the follow-up. So now there's different sectors of society based decisions on data and environmental science produces a lot of data to support a variety of sectors of society to facilitate informed decision making. Well, nowadays we have different tools that are made available to deal with big data. We're speaking about cloud infrastructure, machine learning, and all these tools need data to be interoperable, reliable, and usable. And this calls for data set quality processes which guarantee data reliability and make the acquired data set quality information available to the users. So you see already that there are already some emerging aspects here. We are speaking about quality control, assurance, and dissemination of the information acquired during the quality management processes. As far as the environmental science is concerned, uh, data set quality information tends historically to be focused on scientific quality and is published in scientific journals, which makes it difficult to make uh, this information is acquired readily, readily accessible and maintainable for data management in an operation services. In the recent years, uh, different approaches are moving towards making data set quality information available in a way that is both human and machine readable. But these approaches lack a consensus about community guidelines to follow so that it makes more difficult to really implement data quality management in operational services. So from this uh, uh, introduction, you already see that there are some goals that are popping out. And these goals uh, that we would like to address here uh, we will examine the needs for data set quality information. We will discuss then the, the challenges for, and approaches that are emerging for consistently curate and represent, disseminate the data set quality information in operational environments. And then with this, we will define the needs and scope for the community guidelines. So to discuss a path forward and hopefully to potentially set the timelines for the development of community guidelines. So to, to set the floor for the discussion, we will start with different, uh, with a set of different uh, presentations, all coming from different experiences uh, about data set quality information management. Uh, we will start the first uh, presentation with the uh, JPEG and then the follow up presentations with, which will take approximately less than one hour, 15 minutes, if I remember well. Uh, I will be the, the time manager for this presentation, so every now and then you will hear me to, to stop because we have eight minutes of presentation each. So I would like to leave the, the floor to Jipeng for the first presentation. Thank you, Carlos. So I will give a quick overview about ECIP IQC and touch on multi-dimension of data and information quality. And then Carlo and Dr. Goldberg, Shaw and Albany and Nancy would talk a little bit about evaluate data quality in various different settings from services and data producer perspective and the data centers perspective. I would like to uh, call, acknowledge the uh, chair and the co-chair of IQC, Rama and uh, David. Um, to start with ESIP, our science information partner, and it was originally formed in 1998 by NASA to facilitate cross domain collaborations between uh, data scientists 
uh, data producer, scientist, IT uh, specialist, and a metadata specialist. And it was later joined by NOAA and USGS as a core uh, support, currently with over 140 partner organizations. So ESIP has been providing tools and infrastructures for collaborations in forms of committees and clusters. And the information quality clusters is the um, collaboration area on data and information quality. And it was uh, reactivated in summer 2014. And we, uh, for the last five years, Rama, David and myself have been co-chair of the IQC. The vision of IQC is to become internationally recognized as an authoritative and responsive information sources for guiding the implementation of data quality standards and best practices of science, earth science data systems, data sets, and data metadata disseminated services. Um, we're doing, um, trying to achieve this by sharing experiences and the best practices, uh, including inviting domain expert national international speakers at our monthly telecoms and organizing sessions and presenting at various conferences. And we also maintain a wiki sites with many useful references. We continue to update them when the information become available as much as we could, although we could do it better. And today I will touch on three publications. Uh, one I lead uh, published in 19, uh, 2016 uh, on roles and responsibilities and Rama et al. Uh, 17 paper on multi-dimensional data and information qualities. And recently a white paper on data uncertainty led by David. This role and responsibility paper uh, are in, originated from the challenge and the debate between data centers and the scientists on who should be responsible for curating quality metadata. And some of the rules here, for example, for data producers is to have them provide the product characteristics as well as information on data sources, algorithm and process steps, uh, error estimates, et cetera. The, the ultimate goal is to have transparent, traceable, uh, machine readable, human understandable data product, quality descriptive information. To recognize that the information and expertise required to assessing maturity um, of the quality attributes associates various stage of data product life cycles. Uh, IQC has defined the data quality, data and information quality into four dimensions, um, namely the science, product, storeship, and services. And for example, under science is more focused on the accuracy, position, uncertainty, and the fitness for purpose. And under the storeship, <coughs> sorry, it's more focused how the data is being um, preserved, um, the metadata and the documentations for us access and use. The White paper on data uncertainty, um, there are 19 contributing uh, authors and led by David. It focuses primarily on the discovery of approaches and uh, there are four perspectives are um, described. One is mathematical, one is uh, a programmatic and user and observations. And the paper uh, aims to identify commonality and the differences between different perspectives. And the additional work is undergoing, focusing on the um, modeling data and in situ data. Uh, David will 
be leading two sessions in the summer uh, meeting. And that will be uh, interested to uh, have more community, ESIP wide community discussion to continue the work started for the last white paper. So the IPC is open membership and uh, we think global collaborations and uh, with uh, Rama retiring and uh, we have Yashin has agreed to set up to be IQC chair for next couple of years. And we have a co-chairs, uh, Bob, David and myself um, to be co-chairs for time being. I think David and I are transitioning out in the year also. And that give you um, some idea about what we do. And uh, we would like to invite everybody to join if you find our topic it's interesting to you. The next one is um, Carlos. All right. Uh, uh, go yeah. ahead, Carlos. Okay. So I'm Carlos Cañina, and I work uh, uh, as leader contractor of the evaluation quality control function of the climate data store. Uh, how do I change the slides? I, I'll go. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so to give context, uh, the Climate Data Store is part of the Copernicus program, which is coordinated and managed by the European Commission. And uh, the Copernicus provides uh, lots of information, thematic information services, which are designed to benefit the environment, the way we live, humanitarian needs, and support effective policy making for a more sustainable future. Click. A, one of those uh, uh, thematic information services is named Copernicus Climate Change Service, service which is C3S, which aims at providing comprehensive information about past, present, and future climate to a wide range of users, which ranges from policymakers to researchers. At the heart of the C3S, of the Climate Change Service, is the CDS, the Climate Data Store. Next. Uh, so the Climate Data Store, the CDS, is a cloud-based infrastructure which provides a single point of access to a wide range of, of, of climate data sets, namely satellite and seed observations, pre-analysis, seasonal forecasts, and climate projections, all given from the data suppliers towards the users. Such a complicated infrastructure requires an evaluation quality control EQC function, which provides an overarching quality assurance service for the world CDS. And the different components of the CDS are the data sets, for which the quality control function uh, provides information about the technical and scientific quality of the data sets along with independent assessment. Then we have the other components of CDS, the toolbox, which is a, a box of different software tools uh, that ease the user to use the data sets without the need of downloading them. And so here the quality control assesses the maturity and fitness for purpose of the software provided to explore the data sets. The other component of the CDS is infrastructure, and here the quality control uh, monitors the CDS infrastructure in terms of speedness, responsiveness, system availability, and so on. And then finally, the users of the CDS, for which the quality control measures the user satisfaction with the climate data store and maps, the quality control maps the user needs into requirements to ensure a user-oriented evolution of the CDS. For today, we focus on the CDS datasets only. For the CDS datasets, uh, the quality control function builds a two steps workflow to assess the quality of the CDS datasets, which then leads to the publication of quality assurance records, the QR. The workflow is uh, made of one step, which is, which is named fast assessment, and for which we, we check for compliance with a set of minimum requirements. And then a second step, which is named in depth assessment for which we go more into details of the technical and scientific assessment. And as said, those uh, two steps lead to make available to the end users the, the acquired dataset quality information in terms of, of QAR, so quality assurance reports. And here the user can consult those reports and uh, uh, provide their feedback for improvement and, and expansion of the catalog, as well as uh, improvement of the quality control information acquired. 
so the challenge here is that we would like to, uh, we aim to give a quality assurance information in as much as possible seamless and homogeneous across the different uh, uh, climate data sets. And let's say the CDS serves a, a wide range of data set types, uh, ranging from observations to models at different uh, space and time scales. And so to overcome, overcome this challenge, we introduce uh, the synthesis table. The synthesis table looks like a, a tool that are to organize and homogenize the quality control information in a single entry point to guide the user. It's a human and machine readable because there is a content management system behind to deal with all the information acquired during the quality assurance process. And the left hand side of this uh, table is based on the information obtained by the provider and reviewed during the quality assurance processes. Well, the right-hand side of the table is based on the assessments done by the quality control team independently of the provider. Uh, next. So we focus on the independent assessment. And here, the framework is based on, on three main pillars. One is the data check, the what we could call technical assessment. Uh, here, we check the data and metadata completeness, consistency, physical plausibility, and compliance with the community standards. The middle pillar is about uh, expert evaluation, is what we could call scientific uh, assessment. It is based on the, the basic uh, diagnostics to explore the data sets uh, from a scientific perspective. And then the third pillar is about data set maturity, which is based on the uh, core climax and maturity metrics. These three pillars lead to a summary of the independent assessment, which is based on conclusive remarks, key strengths and limitations, methodology, and operations performed. Next, yeah, you have to click on the, in the end there, it's a video. Video? Next. Yeah, there in the end of this slide, there is a, a play. Ah. Oh. Yeah, oh, okay, I got it. All right. Okay, so all these aspects of the quality assurance information are made available to the end users uh, for each uh, catalog entry. So there is a tab next to the download tab. Then, then uh, the user can click, uh, look for the variable of interest, the, the model and the, the specific uh, system. And then uh, the synthesis table appears uh, with the different boxes, each one uh, showing a different aspect of the quality assurance information acquired. So the user, instead of facing a long PDF, then is shown the different information scattered in order to focus on the information that is deemed of most interest. Uh, and here, clicking on the different aspects, we can see the aspects about access, about uh, uh, more scientific methodology, about the data set overview, as well as uh, uh, the plots about the scientific assessments, which are made dynamic so that the user can uh, change the different parameters like change the diagnostic use, uh, change the, the reference, and so on, with a, a footnote that uh, guides the user to understand the plots. Uh, in view of time, I would uh, click to the next. Yeah, to, so in order to uh, give a, a take home message, I would like to, to conclude that what I've shown here is that the quality control function of the CTS provides an overarching quality assurance service for the world climate data store, uh, both the data sets, the toolbox, the infrastructure, and the users. And the quality control function performs independent quality assessment of a wide variety of data sets in, and makes these available uh, all in one place and homogeneously as much as much as possible homogeneity across the different data sets served by the Copernicus C3S. Uh, the quality control function helps the data producers to understand which information they need to deliver and how to be compliant. And the framework is already uh, defined and implemented in the C3S environment. And of course, the users, as you see, are always uh, central to the development and expansion of the C3S. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. The next talk is on the GPSS and the product algorithm maturity metrics and application.
Good morning. Um, I assume everyone can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear uh, you. Good. Great. Great. Thanks for the invite uh, for this presentation. And um, also, since then, I've been promoted to chief scientist with Inonesa. So, uh, so JPSS is not my only focus now, but it's good that um, I'm attending this conference or this meeting um, so I can learn more about uh, the issues that we need to address across uh, NESDIS. I'm gonna be tag teaming this with Li Hong. Um, she's the product portfolio manager uh, for JPSS. So I'm just gonna give a short introduction, just one or two slides actually, the next slide, and then Li Hong will take over from there. So the next slide um, is our NESDIS mission and vision, which of course the mission is very straightforward, right? Um, it's you know provide global environmental data. Um, but the vision, is important because it's to expand our understanding of our dynamic planet as the trusted source of environmental data. So I always like to uh, understand, well, you know, what does it mean to be a trusted source of environmental data? How does one become a trusted source? And I think this is where everything opens up in terms of quality assessments, access to data. How do you know about the quality, the stewardship, everything that was presented previously? Uh, that's really critical. And that's what we've tried to strive for um, within NESDIS and, and in JPSS, we've been focusing on that. Like how do you provide all the information a user would need to have in order to be a trusted source? So now I'm just gonna transition, uh, I'm gonna ask Li Hong to take over now um, to cover the JPSS products and how we do it in JPSS. Hi everyone, and thanks Mitch. Uh... I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so uh, for JPSS, this is uh, uh, the instrument uh, and product. Uh, we have five ad advanced instruments and uh, launched on SMPP and uh, NOAA 20. And there's a three uh, more satellites uh, are coming. And uh, we have on each satellite, there's more uh, 60 products um, as the bubble chart you see here. And you can find more information in the in the web link there uh, for all the data product uh, information. So for all these products and uh, sensor data records, we use consistent CAVA um, uh, process. Yeah, so don't worry about the instrument and product details because we have every, all the information in one place. Uh, so if you need to know more, uh, go to the website. And for the, all the data products, we use consistent process from data to provisional to validate maturity. And uh, um, also on the same website, you can find for each of the products where they are and uh, whether they are in operation or not and all the uh, Kawao um, details uh, for each of the products. And uh, so for basically for beta, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, the data just come out and uh, uh, mostly for test data uh, flow, but a very minimal uh, Kawao has been done. And provisional, that's important because that's tied to the uh, uh, product become operation. Uh, so the data has been evaluated, use large data sets and meet the requirements. So it's ready for operation, but still uh, there's some work need to be done and uh, more validation need to be do, doing. And then uh, the validation is then they say it's globally, seasonally, all meet the requirement and, uh, and, and they have been validated, fully validated. And, we use that from SMPP, and then now we're using the same process for NOAA 20, and it's further now extended to the uh, GOES program, and it goes 16 and 17, and we use even for when they did the MetaUp, we also use the same uh, for those uh, products we use, uh, you know, from the other uh, uh, international satellites as well. Uh, so uh, it's really a common uh, process that we use across uh, programs. And here's uh, uh, the, um, uh, science metrics and the uh, documentations uh, we check uh, from each of the review. We have the review board led by the DKSS chief scientists and also the user representatives. And, uh, you know, we work together with the science team. They go through all this uh, criteria and see if they meet the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the requirement for each uh, of the by this mature uh, status. We also check whether, you know, we have all the documentation and, uh, uh, and activities and, uh, and all the uh, publications to support the maturity uh, level. And uh, so this is just a snapshot showing how, uh, how much progress we made using the uh, CAVA process for uh, you know, different uh, uh, sensors. 
uh, the red one are the time we spent to reach the maturity for SNTP. The blue ones are the one we reach the same maturity, but for NOAA 20. So by using the same cover process and uh, you know, uh, learn about uh, uh, the census and adapt uh, the enterprise algorithm work, work for uh, different satellites. And uh, it's really accelerate our cover process. And uh, um, uh, we have a well-coordinated science team and very familiar now with the process and apply, adopt also the lessons learned uh, from previous uh, Kawao so that we, you, we are really building on the uh, experience, uh, experience from pro, uh, previous experience. Um, so this is a website uh, really have all the documentation uh, uh, available to the public users and also it's linked to the class. So uh, when people download the data from class, they can also see our uh, detailed uh, uh, documentation for you know the KOL plans, the ATVs, the readme files uh, for each of the product. Uh, so we're really trying to you know uh, have all the uh, documentation on our science artifacts made available to the public users. And uh, so for KOL plan, we just uh, actually uh, received uh, the day two KOL plans. Uh, from the our science team June 20, June 30th, and we are reviewing this and uh, we're going to ask, uh, you know, uh, incorporate the user feedback and the review team's feedback and uh, um, um, finalize those uh, by the end of this year. Um, so we're getting ready uh, for the K2 catalog at this point. And what I just want to briefly say what, what's coming next to us. Uh, so we, we really need to continue um, to uh, do more in depth of the, uh, the validation, the Caval, and establish uh, the partnership uh, for the independent validation. Uh, so, for example, we are working uh, with the NOAA uh, DML uh, to uh, you know, uh, do more independent check. And also, uh, we are uh, reprocessing the mission data uh, using the uh, cloud computing environment for uh, the future reprocessing of all the SDRs and, and, and EDRs. And also, reinforce and establish the partnership and related to uh, the trust resource uh, for the environment information. Uh, so, we promote, uh, promote the best practice and uh, verification. Uh, uh, for the community, endorse the data access and format and documentation. And, uh, maturity and uh, uh, we have more uh, in the backup slides and but I think this is a uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, all the main points we want to present here. Thank you very much Michio and uh, Li Hong and the next talk will be on I'm sorry System Maturity and Application Performance for Climate Data Records by Dr. Shaw. Yes, hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to the world. Uh, so this is about uh, the System Maturity and Application Performance for Climate Data Records. And uh, uh, I give this talk, but there have many, there were many people that have contributed to this uh, over all the years where we were driving this a little bit forward in, in EU research projects. And uh, you have seen from Carlo actually that uh, uh, that it has evolved into a machinery in the in the Copernicus Climate Change Service, where most of the results I present here are being used. So we go back a little bit down to the machine room, and you learn a little bit more about the original intention. So what we observed uh, when we started our first project on this, which is about seven years ago, was about that uh, we had already 20, 30 years uh, of developments in climate data records, and we had a lot of emerging best practices and we wanted to capture those. Uh, we also confronted, and this is still uh, true and even becoming more important, we have complex observing systems and also software engineering has become more complex to deal with all these observe observations. So users deserve good documentation, openness, transparency. And the last bullet is just been taken up by the European Climate Services so that they respond to this with a quantifiable metric. Uh, next slide. So in, the, in one of the EU projects called CLIMAC, so we had uh, invented this, what is called the, the system maturity matrix, but this was only one part of, uh, 
of a, of a capacity assessment that had three parts. So the first thing that you actually need is a, a good description of data records. So you need to really co collect uh, uh, all the technical specifications. Uh, and this you need to do in a homogeneous, uh, homogeneous fashion. And at that time, we took as an example, uh, ops for MIPS activities for CMIP6 to write such, uh, such descriptions. Then the system maturity matrix is really evaluating if the production of the CDR follows best practices for science and engineering. And it's also assessing if data records are actually used and if there is a feedback mechanism in place uh, with the users. So it cannot really measure the quality of the data sets. It's more about the process, how to produce it. And uh, this matrix can be used in a self-assessment than an order type assessment. So which was always, and I think it's still an ongoing debate how you, how you do that because the results are different as I will show you. And then we have the third pillar of this is the application performance metric. And this is really evaluating the performance of a, of a climate data record with respect to a specific application. And this I will show you probably a little more. So next slide. So in general, you can just click once more. So in general, this is just four different questions that we basically asked. One is about the software. This is the engineering piece of this is robust and maintainable. Uh, are all data and methods well documented? This is the documentation bit. Uncertainty characterization, has this been done? And are the data well used and user feedbacks taken care of? And that spans off into the six or different categories for where we put about six different, uh, different uh, uh, maturity levels to each uh, to each of those. And we have no time to go into details. I will show you the result on the next slide. So this was in the, in, in the follow-on project in QA for ECD. So this is for one data record, how the result is actually displayed of the system maturity matrix. So you see these different colors. And this was the, uh, this is the self-assessment uh, that was done by the data provider. And you see here, for example, they had to, a very low maturity in the validation activity, but a higher maturity for the formal validation report. So this needs some, uh, some reviews. And that project for the first time, we also played around with audit type. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that. So uh, the audit type assessment has actually changed the picture a bit more. And what you see then as an end result here is that basically they have done pretty good, good science, which is more the uncertainty characterization. They have done pretty good metadata, but they lack user documentation. So the good hint for this team is, okay, they need to work on the formal aspects of the user documentation. Software readiness is something that's very hard to assess in an audit type, unless you really do a review of how they actually uh, did their software. At least you need to do an interview with those uh, data providers, which is of course pretty costly. Next slide. So then of course, fitness for purpose, and this is probably uh, also very important. And what we call this at that time was the motivation application performance metric. So we can assess the best practices of producing it, but this is no guarantee that it really, really is applicable in a, in a specific application, the data set. So performance assessment or it needs to look at the requirements and we ask ourselves, can we develop a tool that actually supports users directly by informing about available data, how good they fit to user requirements. And this has been tried in the, in the Copernicus, uh, Copernicus Climate Change Service. So user requirements collection exercises uh, show actually large variability in the state of requirements of users, even with nominally similar applications. So unfortunately, there is no, no easy, easy bit of writing down requirements in a universal way. So the, the another user will have a different view even, even if the user has the same application. Um, but a core, a core set of questions that we can always ask, and this is what is called the minimum test in the, in the, in the CDS is, so sufficient coverage, sufficient level of detail, which points to resolution and our observations of adequate quality and how does the quality vary in time? If you click next. So then you see, so this can be, can be, or, a display is coverage sampling information about uncertainty and how it fits to requirements and also stability, which is of course pretty important for climate data records if you look in long-term data records. Next slide. 
So this is the test that we made. So there was a policymaker asking the question of the trends in North Sea temperature uh, and how that, that could affect fisheries. Of course, we played the requirements on the left upper table. So you see you need very long data sets and uh, in an optimal way with high resolution and so forth. We had two candidates here. One is a satellite data set that came from ESA CCI and the other one is an in situ data set. And they have, of course, there are different, uh, different features, in particular on length. And then we just developed a scale from one to three, how it matches, uh, it matches all these different categories and coverage and horizontal, temporal, vertical resolution, length of record, and so forth. Stability, very difficult. But this is a, a very simple result that could present, uh, present it to a user, actually, to make selections out of many data sets uh, that exist for sea surface temperature. So this could help any user who can actually formulate user requirements or can get a useful output from such an exercise. Uh, next uh, slide. So the concept is very simple. So the user is actually providing its own user requirements to this machinery. And then the machinery is basically looking at the database of climate data records, the technical specifications that are available and some uncertainty summary information, which is the most tricky bit uh, actually to have that in a homogeneous form for different data sets. And the output would be CDRs matching these user requirements best. So there would be never any perfect fit, but it's also an educational uh, activity to see uh, what is really matching and what is not. Next slide. So what we thought is, so we have in an international framework, uh, CEOs and CGMS have what is called the ECV inventory. That is a collection of uh, very many, more than 1,000 uh, satellite-based uh, climate data records. And here you see that uh, this is an SST data set from the, I think, the ESA CCI that I just mentioned that's in there with very detailed information about uh, who has done it, why, who is responsible for what. And it has also a lot of record characteristics. Click once more. And here you see, for example, this is so resolutions are there, vertical resolutions, temporal resolutions, and a lot of uh, uncertainty uh, quantifications. Click once more. So what we try to achieve uh, in, the, in the future, if we ever find the resources for that, is to basically make this an interactive tool so that the people uh, get this type of information I showed earlier out of this ECB inventory for the available satellite climate data records. Next slide. And that's a summary, so I think I don't need to read that out, but one needs to, needs to keep in mind that system maturity and application performance are two different, uh, two different things, and, uh, but that we have for the opportunity to connect this uh, not only with the climate data store, which has selected data sets from different sources, but also with the CLC GMS working group uh, on climate ECV inventory, and this is probably something that we will address in the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I need to look at the chat that was blinking all the time. <laughs> we will have a, a QA session after all the presentations. Thank you very much. So the next top presentation is on the data management and storage maturity metrics and application at uh, ESA. Hello. Hello, everybody. This is Mirko Albani from, from ESA. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, so thank you, Japan, for uh, the opportunity to present. Um, as I was mentioning, I'm uh, Mirko Albani from the European Space Agency, and I'm responsible in there of the uh, data preservation uh, program, which is now called Heritage Space, which is addressing the preservation and stewardship of all the heritage data that we have at, at ESA and which is implemented in cooperation within, uh, with the other directorates in, uh, in the agency. Uh, I will give this presentation together with my colleague Yolanda Maggio, so I will just make a, a one slide of an introduction and then I will leave to Yolanda the more detailed presentation on the COSWIGIS data management and stewardship maturity matrix. So as I was mentioning, uh, at ESA we have a dedicated program which is addressing the preservation, the stewardship, management and access of all the uh, data that we call from, from heritage missions. Heritage mission means a mission which is not anymore in operation mm -hmm. since more than five years. Um, and uh, as, you as you might know, the, the agency started acquiring data from third party mission in the mid 70s. So we have a, a, an archive which is plenty of this very old data which need continuously to be improved and uh, uh, reprocessed 
uh, in order to be aligned with, uh, with current data and build time series, which are, uh, for example, essential for climate applications like the ones that uh, uh, Jörg was just, uh, just presenting uh, in, in the previous presentation. In the frame of the program, we, have, uh, we had a lot of international cooperation activities with several organizations uh, in Europe, uh, mainly uh, through the, what we call the Ground Seven Coordination Body, which has been now renamed in Data Coordination Body through the LTDP Working Group, which has been active since 2008. And then internationally with, uh, through CIOS uh, and uh, also standardization uh, organization like uh, CCSTS. In the frame of CIOS, uh, we have a specific subgroup, which is part of the of uh, WIGIS. WIGIS is a technical uh, working group in, uh, in CIOS, uh, which addresses all the different aspects of the data uh, management lifecycle. And in there, we have promoted and produced several best practices uh, together with our international partners like NASA, UMETSAT, and, uh, and NOAA, uh, among others. And we have produced several best practices addressing, for example, uh, data preservation guidelines, the persistent identification of data sets, uh, uh, preservation of uh, information which is associated to data, which is also crucial for the user data. <laughs> of data. But also, um, we have produced uh, recently what we call the data stewardship maturity matrix. And uh, I will leave now the floor to Yolanda in the next slide so she can present the objective of this maturity matrix and, and the content. Thank you. Thank you, Mirko. Thank you, Jipeng, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, before applying the maturity matrix concept uh, at ESA, three questions have been explored. Uh, the first one, what is the maturity matrix or model? Uh, thanks to Jipeng's uh, hard work on this topic, we understand well the objectives of this uh, instrument. It includes all activity needs needed to preserve, improve the information content, quality accessibility, and usability of data and metadata. The other question was, was uh, who could use it? Data providers, modelers, decision makers, scientists, data manager of data center and repositories, and the data curator is new role created uh, at ESA. And why? Why there is a long list of motivation. Uh, because provide data quality usability information to users, uh, because uh, it uh, represents a reference model for stewardship planning and resource allocation, because create a roadmap and so on. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, our maturity matrix, which is the um, peculiarity of our maturity matrix, is in line with the data stewardship concept, but uh, um, we had also uh, we have added also data management uh, element in terms of planning, execution, but also all elements like project uh, needed to enhance uh, the value of data and information asset. Next, please. This is a slide that show uh, uh, the process uh, for um, generate uh, for generation of our data ma maturity and stewardship maturity matrix data ma management. Uh, as you can see, we started uh, with the GPENG uh, maturity matrix for long term scientific data stewardship, uh, to which we had uh, the GEOS data management principle. We had uh, a review uh, cycle internally before uh, uh, going on. And we have also had the DRDA fair data maturity model indicator. And uh, we had another uh, uh, analysis of the last uh, stewardship maturity matrix for climate data from JPENG, from WMO. And uh, we have also had the DSA Earthnet Quality Data Assessment Pilot uh, um, used at ESA. And uh, now uh, our maturity matrix is the following in the following uh, slide. Yes, I know that uh, is not well readable, but we had the link to the white paper, but also you can find the uh, file with the all element, with the all component and the, the four level of maturity. Next, please. Okay, uh, the applications at ESA. Uh, it is an instrument uh, uh, used by, for example, data curator, but also mission manager to fix objective and target for the space data holdings, management and stewardship, uh, thinking also budget and policy and data policy. Uh, it uh, could be also used for monitoring progress and achievement. Uh, we, we start, we, we, we uh, take the missions at a particular um, moment of their life and we go, uh, we do the uh, self 
assessment. It, uh, it is applicable at mission level uh, for what concerns the initial planning, but also uh, at data set level for the verification stage. And uh, we, um, we perform a tailoring uh, it time for each missions and data set. Uh, at the moment, we are using uh, the maturity matrix for the ESA Earth Observation Heritage missions, but we are working to include also the operational missions. Um, the periodic assessment of this maturity matrix allow us to measure gaps in the implemented process versus the stewardship objective. Next, please. Okay, this is an example of our maturity matrix. Uh, One minute our... left applied to the AVHRR uh, missions. As you can see in the hard green, uh, the level is completed. In the light green, uh, we have the partially uh, level reached. Next, please. This is the last slide in which there is the way forward uh, for discussion. We are thinking to create a way to measure in um, uh, having as a score, uh, a number as a score, in order to uh, help uh, who is measuring uh, the data set or missions to give um, a weight of day their uh, level and their activity. And uh, when uh, it will be ready, for sure, we will share with you our results. And stop, I think is, uh, I am time. Thank you very much, Miko and Ilanta. Thank Elanta. you, thank you. So the last, uh, let's see. Last talk is by Nancy, uh, NOAA NCEI Data Storage Maturity Assessment. Hello, everybody. Uh, next slide. I'll talk to you today about the data stewardship maturity assessment that we do at uh, National Centers for Environmental Information. If you don't know who we are, we're part of NOAA. We're responsible for preserving and providing access to a very um, heterogeneous collection of environmental data, comprehensive oceanic, atmospheric, and geophysical data. And uh, next, just showed you some samples there. So in 2015, NOAA asked NCEI to come up with a data discovery system for all of NOAA. And our, our mission was really to improve the discovery and access to the data, but we added in the usability of the vast and diverse collections of data that we have. And my group in particular focused on standards and best practices, which included metadata and data assessment. Next. So we worked with um, North Carolina State Cooperative Institute. Payne was a, a major author and um, architect in this data stewardship maturity matrix. And it is a unified framework for measuring stewardship practices applied to individual digital earth science data products. And there's a link to, to one of the uh, papers. There we go. <clears throat> so the, the data stewardship maturity matrix has nine key components there in the column on the left in the, um, image and it has five levels of maturity. This, this matrix allows for consistent framework for assessing and reporting the quantifiable stewardship practices. It allows for greater stewardship quality transparencies through assessing these practices. It builds trust among the user community and contributes to the reproducibility of NOAA's data products. It was developed jointly with domain experts levering institutional knowledge and community best practices and standards. And it was vetted through multiple use cases and studies with diverse data sets managed by different organizations. And, <clears throat> and I highly recommend that you do that with yours. Next. So we came up with guidance, templates, tools to really help our assessment. So we had a how-to guide, we had uh, a diagram to show the, the actual uh, maturity of all the different components. We had a, a quicker, smaller diagram to add into a report. We had this report template. We even included it in the ISO metadata. Next. 
And then since it was in the metadata, those data sets that actually had uh, that within them could show up in the one-stop user interface. So you could search and, um, and find the data set rating, as you can see there at the bottom, they're circled in red, that's the overall rating. And if you click on that, then you can actually uh, understand what the data stewardship maturity matrix is for that particular data set. But what we found was it's not sustainable as a manual process. We had a large group that was working on these and it's just not sustainable. Next. So what we did was we streamlined the assessment process. So we took those maturity um, key components and turned those into user-friendly questions so that the user could actually um, assess their own data set maturity. Uh, we also allowed this questionnaire, which is incorporated in one of our collection manager enterprise tools, which is part of OneStop, uh, they could also import their metadata record, which could pre-populate some of these fields in the questionnaire. And there's a, a user manual at the bottom there. So what this really does is if we go from left to right, you have a user who fills out the questionnaire, their metadata, their input uh, gets uh, worked through our automated processes. Now, of course, this is the future, those automated processes, does the maturity assessment, it creates the report, it also puts that information into the metadata record. All of that information then goes into or is accessible to the one-stop uh, discovery interface, which creates a landing page for the user, which the user can then use to assess assess the, the certain, the particular use that they wanted um, of that data. Next. So keys to success is, is to really follow this communicate feedback and analysis, prioritization actions and update. You have to involve your users early and often to help you provide them the materials, help them understand what is being asked of them and what your terminology means. And you have to be agile in your approach. So initially we were creating workflows and automating pieces of our process to actually facilitate the, the use of that assessment tool and to allow us to produce more. For one stop, we've gone through more than 800 data sets in a manual process. Next. So um, beyond the questions, I actually have a few more slides there for anyone who's interested in seeing how we implemented these into the metadata. Because uh, I know uh, Ted is on here and he would really be interested in that. And then uh, there's also a slide for more papers on about this assessment. Thank you, Nancy. And, uh, um, all previous presenters for the excellent presentation. All the slides are linked into the Google Doc notes and they will be published after the workshop through easy figure share and I will update them at the uh, workshop website. And the discussion and presentation will continue in the next session and for now we'll open up for uh, about eight minutes also for question that captured in the Google Doc or in the chat, and uh, you may unmute yourself to ask questions. Um, Bob and Yashin would lead that session. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Peng. And uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you good. Okay, so we have lots of questions, so please let us know when uh, our time's about up. Uh, so uh, I'll start here with some questions for all presenters. and. Uh, how might independent assessment by end users be enabled to facilitate quality control? Um, do they say this 
for a particular presenter or uh, any presenter is interested in taking on this question? Yeah, this is for all presenters. So I'll repeat it. How might independent assessment by end users be enabled to facilitate quality control? Does anyone uh, want to answer that question? Any of the presenters? Uh, yeah, this is Mitch Goldberg. I, I can talk about that. I mean, it's clear that um, when we um, you know, generate data products, um, there has to be a clear identification of a, a primary user, at least, right? And so that primary user community um, should be encouraged to do independent assessments, um, especially for very challenging products. And, and so actually next, in a couple of weeks from now, we're having a meeting with the Global Monitoring Lab up in um, Boulder, um, OIR, because we have a lot of trace gas products coming out of um, JPSS, particularly Chris and Ops. Um, and we need their help to independently verify those products. Uh, but they're also very interested because they have a lot of their products or assessments that they make um, are from in situ observations, aircraft measurements, ground basin, and, and things like that. And they do want to extend their data sets or their assessments using um, to satellite products. But of course, before to do that, before you can do that, the satellite products themselves have to be well validated um, and, um, and assessed and things like that. Uh, and, and so if you have the user really involved in the verification product um, process, then they'll be more inclined, right, to trust your data source, number one. They'll learn things. We'll learn things too, because we'll find things that we might have deficiencies that we'll, we're gonna have to correct because of their feedback. And then hopefully at the end, um, you know, we'll have a, a, a user that stays with us, that shows value in our product and, and end up with a better integrated product. So, so I think a best practice needs to be a user uh, well-defined and well-engaged and providing the feedback that we need in order to make our data more, um, uh, for us to understand the quality and the limitations of the data and how best the data can be used um, with other data sources in providing basically services, you know, um, integrated products, whatever the end is. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Mitch. Do any of the other presenters want to uh, tackle that question? Uh, to repeat it, it's how many, how might independent assessment by end users be enabled to facilitate quality control for any of the speakers? Okay, well, hearing none, I guess uh, Mitch has covered it. Let's uh, go to the next one. Does working with the maturity matrix require a lot of scope notes to enable correct interpretation of the metrics by all involved? If so, are there some core materials that are used across groups? And again, that's for any of the presenters. This is Jörg, I may address that. I think I addressed this in the chat already, but uh, of course, uh, the problem is that at least in the beginning when this was new and people were filling those maturity matrices, uh, uh, there was a big lack of understanding what this whole approach is about. But this was more or less in the year uh, 2014. So this is already six years ago. I think the people have been uh, more used to what this is about. But still, to if you have self-assessments, to get this filled in a pretty homogeneous way so that you can actually compare assessments of different data sets with each others, uh, one needs to have interactions with the data providers. And you probably also need to have uh, a lot of interpretation of these uh, results. So in the past, we were always holding actually assessment workshops with the data providers to uh, to really make that happen. No? It's also training for people how to fill this. And I think this might still be possible, but it would be good to hear uh, experiences, for example, from Carlo, what, what they see in the, in, the, in the CDS. So is this only an audit type assessment? George? 
if I got your name right. This is Brian Wester. I, I'm the one that asked the question. Um, so I've, I've seen different, a few different maturity models. I was trying to get at is across all of the organizations that have just presented today, is everybody kind of using a core set of terminology, a core set of questions, or is each group looking at something very specific to their data? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. This is pain. And I think I can address a little bit to that. Um, they are not because they are, well, not all of them are overlapping or different perspective. And that's part of the goal of this workshop is to see whether we can have a community guidelines that would have a common language, even if we're using different maturity metrics or different approach, we could potentially use a common approach to capture that method uh, maturity model utilized and uh, capture the result. Hope that yeah. helps uh, answer your question. And we actually, there are additional approaches in the second sessions uh, from different perspectives. Great, thank you. I was, I'm kind of curious about how it fits with FAIR data too, but uh, we'll talk more. Thanks. Yeah, there will be uh, one uh, presentation on FAIR as well. In a very short a nutshell, FAIR is just a, a small subset of the quality attributes we are trying to assess. Mm -hmm. So and I see anyone, Ted, Ted's put some notes in too, so thanks. Yeah, so did anyone else want to contribute to that question? Provide their perspective? If not, we'll move on. Okay, uh, so for the next question is, what are some of the commonalities and differences among all the assessments presented? Do the presenters think it is important to crosswalk their matrices? So any of the presenters can step up and uh, answer uh, that two-part question. Again, it's what are some of the commonalities and differences among the assessments presented and do the presenters think it is important to crosswalk their matrices? Anyone? Uh, this is Nancy. I can um, try to answer that person's question. Thank you, Nancy. Sure. So as you heard, as people were going through their presentations, that some of the maturity matrices that already existed were leveraged to create their own. So for example, the data stewardship and data management maturity matrix leveraged the data stewardship maturity matrix that uh, we had at NCEI. You'll also see that <clears throat> um, an, another presentation later on from Christina Leaf on WMO also has some commonalities with um, both of these maturity matrices. So they, <clears throat> they, do are, they do have commonalities. And I think what Peng was getting at is we needed to talk about some best practices on how to use these, which may include that crosswalk. Because we do ask similar or, or look at similar aspects, but not necessarily exact aspects. Oh, great, thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, for our next question, for all the presenters, how are efficiencies in quality assessment being attained? Any presenter? What is meant with efficiency? Uh, to become more, uh, uh, to, to utilize less resources. Uh, so it might mean less time or, or less human resources. Yeah, okay, like, sorry. Were you going to, to answer that or otherwise I'll go. So this is Nancy and with these maturity matrices, it actually gives that framework to do that assessment. So in the past, when every, when each scientists could do their own assessment and have some peer review of their work, there wasn't really a consistent framework to be used in that assessment. I think it makes it more efficient if you have that framework so that 
you are consistently making that assessment. That way you can actually understand one data set maturity matrix versus another one if they're using that same matrix and um, assessment criteria. And then if that is included in the metadata, it allows, um, and that metadata is machine readable, then it allows more uh, machine capabilities to, to help someone utilize the data sets that meet their um, <clears throat> quali quality requirement. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Nancy. Did anyone else want to uh, add in on that? Uh, how are efficiencies and quality assessment being attained? Any other presenters? Well, the only thing I would like to add is that uh, if I interpret well with efficiency is uh, in terms of scalability, but also in terms of the framework that the Nancy was uh, speaking about. The framework is something that uh, uh, you get more and more the, the quality function gets mature. So itself, there is also a, a maturity assessment of the quality uh, function itself. So the more you get experience, the more efficient becomes the, the, the assessment. And so really you can attain what the question here is asking. Oh, great. Thanks. And I'd like Thank to you. add one thing about that is once you do that assessment and you see where you may not be as mature as you would like to be, that helps you identify where you need to do a little extra work. Exactly. Um, thank you, Bob and Yashin for leading the Q&A session. Given the time, uh, we're going to stop that section for the time being. However, um, everybody is encouraged to put their question in the um, Google Doc notes as well as in chat continuously. And uh, we'll push it and ask um, presenters to potentially answer them offline um, between sessions today. Thank you very much. So the next segment is to have um, about 13 minutes, uh, 15 minutes ish for the case statement review. And we will have a small break up, break up uh, rooms and uh, I think Aaron, do you need me to uh, stop sharing my screen? Hope you're okay. It'll stop sharing automatically. Um, okay. And I'm ready to go when you are. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna send everybody to a breakout room um, and you don't have to do anything. You'll just join um, and you'll have a co-chair in that room who will um, help guide the discussion. So here we go. And it says 13 minutes and then there's a two minute timer that will um, countdown to call you back. So um, you'll have two minutes to wrap it up. event and co-chairs and everybody else that has been participate in this great um, successful session. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thanks, Payne. It was a good job. Thank you. So I think Carlo uh, would talk um, for next few minutes, talk about Pass Forward. And yes. anybody who's interested in stay um, behind after session, please do so. And you, we have a break room that you can utilize. All right, thanks. Uh, so after the breakout sessions and the, the question around and answers, it was clear that there is a, a need for some guidelines and there are different expertise and experiences that would be nice to together so in order to not waste the the kickoff where we we have with this uh with this workshop we consider that the path forward with timelines would be good to set uh, so 
So uh, the, we, during the next ASIP uh, 2020 summer meeting, we, there will be a report out. Don't miss it. It's on the 22nd of July. And then the end of August, we, the, the organization committee will complete a summary of the workshop to distribute to the attendees. And uh, we will update the, the workshop website. Uh, so in order to wrap up what we said uh, so far. And then uh, in the early October, the committee members will consolidate outcomes to draft the guidelines document. And in the meantime, between, uh, between now and early October, there is a continuous uh, collaboration so everybody can uh, include their perspectives, comments, and so on in the Google Doc uh, to enter ideas and uh, uh, to be edited in a collaborative way that for sure will help the, the consolidation of the guidelines document. And then the next uh, uh, timeline is uh, uh, in mid-December, we hope to have a complete draft and uh, so to share with the collaborators for feedback and then finalize it uh, in a, in a sol consolidated form to be submitted in March, 2021. Thank you. Um, again, the uh, comments on the timelines uh, can be entered in the, the Google Doc and that concludes this uh, live session, the first uh, live session of the workshop. And I'll be staying uh, behind. And uh, I think most of the co-chairs will do so for a little longer, should you uh, have additional questions or want to have additional uh, discussions.